Hi everyone and welcome to the three minute thesis competition at M2Gars 2022. We are incredibly excited to have all of you here with us today in this year's virtual competitions. Today we are here to see 10 outstanding students present their research work live in only three minutes. So the three minute thesis, also called 3MT, is a research communication competition developed initially at the University of Queensland in 2008. The goal of the competition is to challenge students to present a compelling spoken presentation on their research topic and its significance in just three minutes with one static slide. So no animation, no videos, and in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. We are very glad to have with us today amazing judging panel. So I want, first of all, to thank them to, um, for, for uh, being here today with us. And the three winners of today's competition will be selected thanks to their effort. We are very glad to have Professor Begum Demir from Berlin Technical University, Professor Yakub Bazi from King Saud University, Dr. Musa Sofian Karwi from the Algerian Space Agency, and Professor Mohammed Abdel Magid Salem from the German University in Cairo. Thank you very much. And now I will hand it over to Professor Bekim to present to us the uh, criteria of selections and give a word to the finalists. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Faris, for the um, starting. So, uh, as you may all know, uh, we had uh, 18 uh, candidates, and among these 18 candidates, we selected the 10 uh, best finalists. And uh, congratulations to all our finalists for the great job that they have done. And I would like to uh, emphasize that we have already evaluated these finalists in terms of their presentation skills, scientific quality, and topic originality. That means that you have done already a great job and now it is our challenge to select the, to select the three candidates among these 10 based on three different criteria. The first one is about communication. So that is the way how you will be communicating to present your research activities to us. Okay, so if your presentation is clear, legible and concise. And then the second criteria is about comprehension. So comprehension uh, is related to the um, related to the fact that if the presentation follows a clear and logical sequence, if you clearly describe your key results and so on. And the third criterion is about engagement. So engagement um, uh, is associated to the fact that if you capture and maintain the audience attention, yeah? so how you are uh, ambitious uh, with your research topic and your enthusiasm. Okay, so based on all these three criteria, we will be selecting the three uh, best um, uh, application, okay? But we would like to really uh, clearly emphasize that you have done already a great job and now it is our challenge, okay? And um, here uh, you see the prizes. Uh, I'm sure that you're already aware of that. And also uh, we will be uh, selecting a People's Choice Award, okay? So this is, this will be the award uh, based on the uh, audience vote. Okay. So now uh, let me uh, briefly tell you the agenda of this session. So uh, after my uh, part, uh, each uh, presenter will be presenting his or her research topic in three minutes. And then there will be a very short question answering session. And then the uh, subsequent presenter will start, okay? So uh, after that, um, the panel committee members will have a private discussion to evaluate, assess uh, these 10 candidates. And then uh, while we are having our discussion, uh, people's choice voting will be applied, okay? Then uh, the audience will be selecting uh, that uh, awardee. And then we will be coming back to the session to announce the three winners. Okay, so this is the program of this session. So um, next slide. Yeah. Are there any next? Okay. So then it's over to you, Harris. Thank you, Professor Pekin. So now that we all know the rules, let's get started. So um, just uh, note that please stay muted all along the all the presentations. 
and uh, I will I just post it on the chat box, the evaluation sheet that you can use to give a score for every presentation that will help you later in the audience people's choice uh, voting. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Bahar Asadi from Tarbiat Mudarris University in Iran. Her talk will be about application of deep learning method for crop mapping based on Sentinel-1 and 2 data fusion in Ardabil province in Iran. Hello, Bahar. Hi, good afternoon. So uh, the floor is yours, so you may start whenever you want. Uh, hi. Uh, I want to talk about uh, my thesis. It's about application of deep learning method uh, for crop mapping based on uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data fusion. As we know, one of the important application of uh, satellite imagery is uh, crop uh, identification, uh, which is a major issue, uh, uh, which is a major issue for uh, uh, agricultural management. This study aims to answer this question, how a decision fusion of support vector machine, random forest, uh, uh, convolutional neural network uh, can improve accuracy of crop mapping. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we use um, uh, object-oriented method, as well as uh, we collected the uh, crop type reference data through a GPS survey. And um, I want to say uh, methodology. As we see in this uh, flowchart, uh, we use the uh, biweekly time series, Sentinel-2 time series and Sentinel-1 time series, and uh, we done uh, pre-processing and uh, extracting some features in Google Earth engine. Uh, satellite image uh, were uh, segmented by uh, multi-resolution segmentation and multi-resolution segmentation method. And uh, in addition, uh, we extract some features uh, from images uh, such as the uh, uh, different red edge spectral indices and VV and VH uh, uh, backscatter, and so on. We use the random forest feature selection method for uh, um, the, the, for feature selection. Uh, uh, and uh, we use and we um, we identified important feature and introduce as input for random forest and uh, um, uh, SVM classifier. The best integration of radar and um, optic uh, um, features uh, were classified by CNN method. Uh, all um, all uh, algorithm um, were uh, fused uh, were uh, fused by uh, voting method. Uh, the result uh, showed that, uh, as we see in this chart, uh, CNN method uh, performs uh, the random forest and support vector machine. And uh, then uh, the another result uh, even is a decision fusion of uh, mach machine learning and deep learning uh, leads to improve uh, overall accuracy and uh, kappa uh, coefficient. Uh, as we see in this chart, uh, some crops uh, are uh, better, uh, uh, were uh, better identified, uh, such as uh, wheat, alpha alpha, and uh, sugar beet. Mm. Uh, stone. Thank you very much, Bahar. So now we have time for giving the score. And if the judging panel have questions, so you're welcome to ask. Thanks so much. Maybe so I maybe can I start. Can yeah, please start. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a very simple question. Uh, I noticed in your uh, figure about uh, F1 user that for some classes you have uh, similar uh, performance between uh, the fusion and the, the CNN approach. Uh, can you give us a comment about this? Um... Uh, we um, we result uh, show uh, uh, show uh, random forest method and uh, CNN methods uh, have a um, close uh, result uh, because uh, 
my uh, trained sampling my uh, sampling for training model uh, uh, is uh, fewer and we need uh, more uh, samples uh, to um, train uh, cnn and can um, get better results um, uh, and um, do you okay thank you Okay, so thank you very much, Bahar, uh, for the interesting study. I have a very quick question. Uh, when you say fusion in the graph, is this fusion uh, about fusion of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 or fusion of CNN, RF, and SVM? Um, I do uh, both of them. I uh, fused uh, um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data um, to combination uh, with... Uh, combination uh, then and uh, after uh, finally uh, we um, uh, we uh, combining or uh, we uh, fusion and uh, svm and random forest and uh, cnn uh, method uh, which it with uh, each other and um, uh, for um, i have a three percent uh, um, uh, increase uh, in uh, copper uh, um, coefficient and uh, uh, three, uh, two or uh, three uh, percent uh, increase uh, accuracy in uh, overall accuracy. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So let's move to the next presentation. So the next talk will be given by Sazia Ozko Atik from Istanbul Technical University. And her CMT talk is about developing a deep learning based land use and land cover mapping model using remote sensing data. So, hello, Sazia. Hello. So, the floor is yours. You can start whenever you want. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My PhD is at Istanbul Technical University in Turkey, and the title is Developing a Deep Learning Based land use and land cover mapping model using remote sensing data. Here you can see the general flow charts. And as input, remotely sensed data is using in the model first, and as deep learning, deep learning model, convolution neural network models were used in the experiments. In the end of the CNN models, first thematic map is obtained, and you can see as the prediction of CNNs here, you can see some salt and pepper effects and some errors as other deep learning studies. There are some errors like that. So for resolving this problem in the thesis, a proposed approach is used. The name is CNN MRS. MRS is coming from multi-resolution segmentation, which is object-based image analyze algorithm. And simply uh, only in the remotely sensing image, multi-resolution segmentation borders are obtained and integrating these borders as segments with the prediction of CNN results. So with this model, some salt and pepper effects and errors can be removed particularly. And in the end of the model, the new land use and land cover map is obtained. So in the PhD thesis, uh, it's, uh, it has a capability using middle, high, and very high resolution images. Uh, so in the experiments, also three data sets were used. One of them is Sentinel-2 data sets uh, is created for only this thesis, but the other two data sets were public data sets. You can see in the detailed flowchart the Zurich Summer dataset and Wuhan University Building Extraction dataset, WUBET uh, dataset. So, in these three datasets, Sentinel 2, GoFan 2, WorldView 2, and Econos images were used. Also, in the models, not only three band combinations were used in the CNS, also five band and seven band combinations were used. It means several uh, proper uh, spectral indices were used. Also, extra spectral band can be used in the model. 
So in the CNN models, SegNet, UNet, DeepLab V3 Plus, uh, and for feature extraction, ResNet 18, ResNet 50, and Exception and MobileNet with uh, version 2 models were used. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Sadia. So we have three minutes for questions, so maybe two questions from the judging panel. Yeah, I have a question. Uh... What do you mean by uh, ResNet 18 plus uh, DeepLab uh, V3 plus? DeepLab version 3 is used as CNN model, but for uh, feature extraction phase, it's not ResNet uh, 18, ResNet 50, exception and MobileNet version okay. 2 were used okay. as but, like but, backbone. But, but in the DeepLab, uh -huh. Which kind of which kind of backbone you are using? Sorry, which type which of backbone? Of? Because if you take a deep lab, you have some kind of backbone. Yes, in the deep lab the... itself. Uh -huh. But these what is the, the name of this? But what is the name of this uh, backbone? Resnet 18, 50, exception, and mobile net version two were backbones. So you uh, means you are using uh, you are using two networks, so the ResNet uh, eighteen then uh, then DeepLab with a certain re another ResNet right? Oh no, as CNN model, SegNet, UNet, and DeepLab version three plus were used. In DeepLab version three plus, for feature extraction, these four models were used. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe a short question. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very short question. Why you used three types of, uh, of optical uh, remote sensing data? Uh, <laughs> do, you do, you perform a, do you perform a fusion after uh, obtaining your results or, uh, or you perform your, uh, your classification or uh, detection by using uh, at uh, each time one image or one type of image or uh, you perform fusion after that? Yes, for proving the model is working with uh, several uh, spatial resolutions we want to see in the thesis. So that was the reason. Also the uh, most um, change happened in Sentinel-2 uh, because in the prediction of CNN, Sentinel-2 images were, uh, had more uh, salt and pepper effects, but after this proposed approach, it's removed uh, mostly, but uh, Zuri summer data set or the other data set has a uh, very high resolution image. Also, again, uh, the results were uh, enhanced uh, with the proposed approach, but uh, less than Sentinel-2 data set. Uh, I want to give the uh, percentage for this, six percentage for Sentinel-2 data set, uh, the results uh, get better, but uh, three percentage for the other two data sets, approximately, uh, for uh, F1 score and general, general accuracy. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Um, maybe you have already explained this, but uh, and I miss it. Um, my question is: uh, You are addressing three resolution levels, right? Yes. Um, in the image segmentation part, do you do the segmentation using conventional techniques on the three levels, and then you support your decision by the outcome of the uh, deep learning models um, uh -huh. by the autoencoders? Or do you mean, or do you apply the autoencoders uh, to segment the uh, three levels? So you have three segmentation steps done parallel uh, based on the resolution. You're asking for multi-resolution segmentation or uh, whole? Yeah. Huh. No, multi I'm asking about the multi-resolution segmentation and how it's related or connected mm -hmm. to the uh, deep learning models used. Okay, uh, 
uh, there is an integration integrating system so uh, i am only using the image as input of multi resolution segmentation uh, so uh, not, it's not about using cnn result for multi resolution segmentation but after getting the results of multi resolution segmentation now i am integrating the result of cnn and the result of multi resolution segmentation in that case i mean not together so um two algorithm cnn and obia uh, i mean multi resolution segmentation is using pixel based uh, okay uh, the multi the multi resolution segmentation algorithm is called obia yes but uh, I am not doing classification there, only getting the segments. So Pixel I'm wise. using, yes, these borders with the result of Siena. So removing some errors. And then you do the fusion or the integration afterwards, after you have the both results from the deep learning model and from the multi resolution segmentation. Yes, it's kind of enhancement because I'm using the result of CNN models map and multi-resolution segmentations segments, I mean objects together, and then refinement for the result of the CNN models. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So the next presentation will be given by Burak Ekim from Istanbul Technical University in Turkey and Bundeswehr University in Munich in Germany. His talk is about land cover and land use classification of multimodal high resolution satellite images using multi-desk deep learning approach. Hello, Burak. Um, hi, thank you for the introduction. So the floor um, is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Now I'm going to present my thesis. Um, the task here is pixel-wise and pair-wise classification, and the goal is straightforward. Mapping land cover and land use classes for a given satellite imagery, and the task of land use and land cover classification is of great importance for various domains, needless to say. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. It has three distinct research directions, this thesis. Um, first is creation of a data set with 14 classes where the classes are adopted from Korean nomenclature and two specific ways of approaching this task with deep learning, multimodal learning and multitask learning. Um, the data set used in this thesis left hand side of the screen is created from scratch and contains two modalities, optical um, from SPOT7 and SAR from TerraSRX satellites. The manually created ground route contains diverse and complex classes. And given the challenge of creating pixel-wise annotations, we adopted a weak course labeling strategy where semantically close and similarly um, and semantically similar and spatially close objects are assigned to same label. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, we have the multimodal parts of the Tazis, where we investigate three ways of fusing two models, this optical and SAR. And these three uh, ways are early fusion, middle fusion, and late fusion. The focus here is um, data fusion provides valuable hints that are lost if these connections are not established. This is the underlying um, motivation of this uh, particular experiment. In the multitask learning, which can be seen on the right, lower right hand side of the screen, and um, the main task is coupled with two auxiliary tasks, boundary extraction and image reconstruction to help the model to better delineate and map the classes by leveraging and then uh, by exploring first and then leveraging the common linear representation in a unified learning scheme, which is guided by homoscelastic uncertainty-based loss function. Um, results for the multimodal learning, it has been found that um, early fusion further increases the performance and MTL experiments shows the possibility of harnessing common linear representation, harnessing from common linear representation by simultaneously learning auxiliary tasks along with the main task. And here we can say the main task here shares um, hidden representation with the auxiliary tasks. 
And the techniques introduced in the studies allows fast and full automatic generation of accurate segmentation maps, which then can be provided to um, policymakers, decision makers, NGOs, etc. Um, with that, I complete my presentation. Thank you all for watching. Thank you very much, Burak. So yeah. we have time for one or two questions from the chat. So. Uh, you have here L task two, and then you write something one over two sigma square L one theta. What is this? What yeah. are these equations? Perfect. Thank you for the question. That's the formulation um, to use. Um, that's loss function, uh, which guides the training procedure. And the sigma parameters here are learnable parameters. So instead of manually tuning the loss weights, individual loss weights, um, we learn them using homostatic uncertainty based logic. And the L underscore uh, terms that are uh, associated with each task. So they are loss terms. L1, for example, here, the loss term of boundary extraction task, and L2 segmentation, and three is the image reconstruction task. And the sigmas there are. Um, simply coefficients, which we learn throughout the learning training process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have also a quick question, Burak. Um, so you have uh, two image modalities, right? Two input modality here in the figure. Can I have four, for example, how it will be adapted uh, to more than two? Yeah, um, it it can be adapted to have more modalities as input because the fusion operation here takes place uh, channel wise. So no matter what uh, we fit the model with, it should generalize well with the number of images modalities, so to speak. Okay. I mean, I have one very quick, I couldn't resist not to ask this. <laughs> so when we have multitask learning, one of the problem is catastrophic forgetting. Do you think that your approach is uh, not affected with that? Um, yeah, thanks for that, it's a good one. Um, yeah, um, I haven't, um, I haven't really conducted experiments to really understand that phenomenon within this context. But um, I think, um, to be honest, my experiment setup also suffers from that exact phenomenon. So I, this, this, task, this task itself um, is not trying to attack that phenomenon, rather uh, trying to de develop another technique. So it's kind of uh, out, out of the scope in this, in this exact experiment setup. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next presentation will be given by Ida Nur Firat from Ege University in Turkey. Her yes. talk will be about an investigation of the relationships between sugar, beet yield, and biophysical vegetation indices obtained from multispectral images. Hello, Ida Nur. Hi, uh, my presentation will, uh, going, is going to be different after this uh, three presentation that we saw actually. Uh, I'm ready to start, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What, what did you say? Yeah, yeah present whatever you want. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm ready to start, actually. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Um, I want you to uh, think about climate crisis in this way. It will negatively affect agricultural production capacity and quality. It's estimated that 95% of our food is directly or indirectly produced on our soils. The climate crisis will primarily affect soil resources. Factors such as the effect of the global climate crisis on the product pattern are also very important for adequate food production. And Turkey is one of the countries that will be highly affected by the climate crisis. And when we think in terms of water demand, sugar beet is also one of the important industrial products that will be primarily affected by the climate crisis. In order to produce en enough sugar per capita, it's very important to be able to predict the yield of agricultural products in a pre-harvest period. This is why we focused on this subject. And we designed a thesis on associating sugar beet production with biophysical plant indexes. The, integ the integration of agriculture and technology is very important for sustainability. In this thesis, our mandate is to create new data sets in a sustainable agricultural model. 
In most of the studies met with multiband and high resolution satellite images, and this is like the NDVI, so we are generally discussed and examined. examined. Apart from them, indices such as leaf chlorophyll content, photosensitively active radiation, which show the biophysical properties of plants, have not been adequately investigated. In our thesis, biophysical data and maps produced from Sentinel-2 satellite images that were taken from different times during the vegetation period are monitored. As one of the conclusions of our thesis, the success rate of biophysical vegetation indexes in monitoring product is uh, investigated by revealing the statistical relationships between the yield information obtained at the parcel level after the harvest time and the biophysical vegetation index data. And as an initial result, we determined that satellite data and field work are higher measurable and can be used in agricultural studies. Thus, it will also contribute to the monitoring of agricultural areas in, in Turkey in accordance with sustainability criteria determined by FL. And that's all I can say. Thank you, Edano. That was great. So, um, can I start? Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your nice presentation. I have a very short question. I noticed in your uh, slide that you use the Sentinel-2 images. Uh, can you give us a comment uh, about the choice of, uh, of July, August, and September? Yes. Uh, uh, did, did you ask about the um, data in July, in August, and in September that I have? Did you ask about it? Well, what is the motivation of choosing July, August, and September? Ah, okay, okay, I get it. Uh, when we looked at the vegetation period in Turkey, uh, okay. we determined okay. the best periods to observe the development level of the plant as July, August, and September, and that, that's why we got satellite image from these months, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question also, Eda. So um, how did you achieve this statistical analysis of the data? What did you do there to statistically yes, uh, analyze the effect, The effect size and power analysis we did in SPSS. But it's, uh, the, there is much more, uh, we, we, we will do uh, some statistical analysis between uh, indexes and uh, field works. I'm still working on my thesis, but initial results is uh, great, actually. It's, it's okay. Great. Okay. Okay. So uh, you uh, did you also uh, take part in the data collection stage or only the lab work? So did you also go to the ground to collect the data? Yes. Uh, the picture uh, is is it's me actually. Okay. I'm using careful <laughs> matter uh, on area on uh, on field work. Mm -hmm. I did lab work uh, for total mm -hmm. and and net nitrogen analysis and land work. Uh, to get chlorophyll, chlorophyll data and plant spacing cal calculation and uh, then uh, uh, associating with them these indexes actually. <laughs> okay, okay, interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have a very short question. Uh, what do we mean by uh, NDVI and SAVI? Uh, NDVR is an in the index, uh, is, it's normalized difference vegetation indices, and SAVI is soil adjust, adjust, adjusts, I'm sorry for my <laughs> adjusted okay. vegetation index. And uh, this is our uh, indexes that I use, but uh, with them, actually, this, this one is ra uh, radiometric indices with. Uh, unit list your radiometric measurements, but uh, when we looked at biophysical plant indexes such as leaf area index or chlorophyll uh, content index, they have a unit like uh, chlorophyll content index uh, is, is gram per square centimeter. Uh, it's the difference between them actually, but, uh, but what I will, what I did, you look, uh, look at biophysical plant indexes and uh, unit stereometric measurements like NDVS, so we both of them, I looked at looked both of them actually. Okay, so we can go now to the next presentation. And the talk now is, will be given by Kishor Chandra Kandpar from the, 
from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Institute of the Himalayan Bioresource Technology in India. His talk will be uh, on on-site age discrimination of medicinal plant species using hypospectral remote sensing and machine learning techniques. Hello, Kishore. Uh, hello. Uh, can you? Oh. Yeah, we can uh, hear you very okay. well. Okay. Okay. Shall I start? Uh, he hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present on-site age discrimination of medicinal plant species using hyperspectral remote sensing and machine learning techniques. In this study, uh, the experiment was done uh, uh, using uh, a medicinal crop, uh, Valeriana jatamas, which is widely distributed in Indian Himalayan region. And this plant is known for its essential oil content, uh, which are present in its root. And it is extensively used uh, in pharmaceutical industries. So it is important to uh, know, uh, it is important to identify its uh, age because the amount of these essential oil content depends on uh, the age of uh, Valeriana jatamasi. Uh, and conventionally, uh, the age identification was done by using some uh, taxonomical uh, methods or some uh, morphological features. So hyperspectral remote sensing has great potential to discriminate the age of any plants uh, using its uh, unique spectral signatures. And machine learning algorithms are very popular these days because their preciseness to uh, classify or identify any feature. So in this study, we have used a, a non-imaging uh, hyperspectral sensor called spectroradiometer uh, to collect the unique spectral signature of Valeriana jatamasi at different growth stages like uh, six month, uh, 12 month, 24 month, and 36 month. So uh, after the data collection, we have done some uh, pre-processing step, and uh, then we have applied uh, the principal component analysis to uh, identify the optimal wavelength region, and uh, which are responsible for uh, disc discriminating the age of Valeria Valeriana jatamasi. So uh, through this study, we uh, found uh, these. Uh, we found two uh, wavelength regions. These are uh, some uh, some are found in near infrared region and some are found in red age region. And then we applied uh, these optimal wavelength uh, region on six uh, six classification modules. Uh, and uh, these are artificial neural network support vector machine, random forest boosting decision tree, decision tree, and K nearest neighborhood. And uh, through this study, we found that uh, among these classifier, ANN uh, model is best for discriminating the age of Valeriana jatamasi. And uh, we accounted 100% classification accuracy with a uh, kappa coefficient of one. And uh, this work is initially done uh, uh, and this model, uh, these model are trained in uh, control condition in our in, uh, in in our laboratory, and finally we validate uh, our model uh, to farmers field, uh, and we achieve 88 percent accuracy with a kappa coefficient of 0.84. So uh, through this study, we conclude that the combination of hyperspectral remote sensing and artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, classifiers has great potential to discriminate the age of any plant and thus the developed gen light model we can use uh, we can utilize on a wider geographical region uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind attention thanks kishar so we have time for maybe two questions thank you very much for your presentation I have a very short question. Do you think that we can do the same work by using airborne or spaceborne hyperspectral? Uh, uh, yes, sir, we can do. Initially, uh, uh, the current model uh, developed for only on-site application. In future, we can use this model uh, for uh, uh, drone-based or some satellite-based remote sensing set satellites or sensors. And what is the, the best resolution uh, for such work, uh, best, sir, uh, best, best special resolution of uh, of hyperspectral remote sensing data for such work, uh, sir. I think uh, in centimeters we can use for this uh, this model. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, thanks. Uh, I have also a short question. What is the difference between uh, you mentioned here testing accuracy and validation accuracy? Uh, sir, uh, the uh, testing accuracy, uh, we split the data set uh, into uh, th th three parts. The first one is training, the second one is uh, testing, and the final validation on the ground level. The, the in initially, we uh, uh, trained our model in a laboratory condition and then tested it 
uh, also in laboratory condition and finally we validated our, validated our model uh, in farmer's field okay yes thank you sir um i have a very quick one also so in the results you mentioned k1 k0.84 is this k is the same k of knn uh no ma'am it, it it is a kappa a kappa accuracy actually okay yes so which method provided the best results then ma'am uh, artificial neural network uh, accounted okay. best result okay yes ma'am okay thank you Thank you. Okay, so now we can move to the next presentation. Thank you, Kishore. Our next presenter is Fuad Kaya from Isparta University of Applied Science in Turkey. His 3MT title is Machine Learning and Remote Sensing for Digital Soil Mapping. Hello, Fuad. I thank you for introduction. Hello everyone. Uh, soil, soil surveys figure out according to soil science conceptual model because of the mental uh, met methodological models practically non-reproducible uh, because of uh, personal uh, subjective naturally. Sustainable development goal life on land has, has its goals to protect, uh, restore and promote sustainable use of soil. Actually, soils are a key resource in reaching this uh, goal. We are a need for spatially accurate uh, determination of the, the diversity of soils and assessment for our uses. For, uh, formation of soil can be written as a uh, slight uh, function, spatial rep representation of uh, soil formation factors with digital uh, data are lost to functions uh, to produce spatial results. Basis of digital soil mapping is the use of the predictions al algorithms that are able to uh, account for the uh, spatial variability of soil uh, distribution. The basis for generating digital soil maps is the spatial support of prediction factor representing soil forming environment. Nowadays, remote sensing produce, uh, products provide temporal, spatial, and spectral information about soil at the Earth's surface. The, the, these data have been open access facilities, are safely used in digital soil mapping as a digital surrogate correlates of soil formation factors, such as uh, is uh, function, uh, organism, topography, and parent material. We are combined to use of passive and active sensors in remote sensing. We are applied machine learning algorithms to predict the spatial distribution of soil tips in Turkey using soil observations and uh, environmental variables derived from Landsat satellite image and digital elevation model. Probability of presence or absence of a soil class estimates are derived from the use of machine learning models for supervised uh, at the presence of training data for a, a target variable or uh, unsupervised st statistical learning in the absence of a responsible variable. Open source statistical software. Uh, uh, that is our uh, programming where you use it to produce digital soil maps, multinomial logistic regression algorithm is defined as a, a supervised uh, learning algorithm. Spatial maps were produced in the field uh, with soil class models uh, learned from the existing training set. The, this Kamins algorithm uh, that unsupervised learning algorithms has been applied to define areas where the formation of soil classes as a result of the cluster of environmental variables. The accuracy uh, was evaluated for validation set, cup index, and uh, overall accuracy. As a result of the supervised classification method, have high accuracy, uh, digital soil maps can be represent the continuous uh, nature of the soil variable. To the digital soil maps can be qualified data that can be used as input to digital agricultural systems. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that. Um, floor is for the judges to ask some questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, for the interesting talk. So um, if I get it well, uh, here you use K-means algorithm, right? K-means algorithm is uh, unsupervised learning algorithm. Is yes. uh, We use it uh, Landsat based in this and uh, topographic uh, based index uh, digital elevation model. 
uh, we uh, we are a spatial cluster in uh, randomly selected points in uh, cluster points and uh, uh, iteratively in Kamins algorithm uh, at uh, Euclidean distance in uh, based on the uh, cluster produced. Okay. Um, do you have any motivation to use K-means here and not the other uh, clustering approaches? Yes, maybe uh, we are uh, basically algorithm is uh, explainable uh, machine learning in soil science. Uh, very, very new approach in uh, uh, methodological uh, very, um, as uh, 50 or uh, 10 years in uh, soil science, uh, soil science and uh, soil, soil science uh, and uh, soil survey uh, science uh, scale. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you for it. So now we will move to the next presentation which will be given by Mahdi Khoshporash Masula from University of Tehran in Iran. His CMT title is Building Panoptic Change Segmentation. Hi, Mahdi. Thanks, hi. Uh, the title of my talk is Building Panoptic Change Segmentation with use of uncertainty, uncertainty estimation in squeeze and attention CNA and remote sensing observations. In map updating, the certainty of building change results is important for engineers to make the decision. However, in real world applications, uncertainty estimation for extracting building change is still an open problem in remote sensing. In semantic change segmentation, the goal is to classify each building change pixel into a given class and the predicted map is a binary mask. In instance change segmentation, the goal is to classify each semantic building change as a unique instance with a 2D polygon. Unlike instance change segmentation, panoptic change segmentation does not require confidence escrows associated with each change segment. Moreover, panoptic change segmentation allows assigning the unique semantic change label to each change pixel of the bitemporal images, while instance change segmentation permits overlapping change segments. In this study, I propose a squeeze and attention CNN called SACNN that takes features for building panoptic change segmentation. Unlike previous approaches that use the residual neural network series as a backbone network, I use the multi-scale net as a backbone network for multi-scale segmentation and use a region-based temporal aggregation on Calvo drop, which can further improve the uncertainty estimation to guide the building panoptic change segmentation. Due to the general mechanisms, ignore an implicit subtask sub of segmentation and are constrained by the greedy structure of convolution filters, the squeeze and attention mechanisms is proposed to learn how the approach tackles that issue. The generated data set consists of item pro remote sensing images labeled for building change segmentation with a period of five to 40 years have significant land use change from 20 various areas that sit in different cities in the United States. The full label data set contains a total of 31,000 change building instances. The quantitative, quite the quantitative assessments of the bitemporal RGB image, images show that the panoptic quality or PQ, recognition quality, quality or RQ, segmentation quality or SQ, and mean intersection of reunion or MIU for building panoptic change segmentation are about 91%, 94%, 96%, and 97% percent respective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mandy. So we have short time for maybe only two questions. So Professor Yaku. I have just one question. What is the difference between ordinary segmentation and panoptic segmentation? Segmentation, uh, some segmentation in, in general, segmentation uh, is a semantic segmentation, but panoptic segmentation uh, combine uh, a sem semantic and instance segmentation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, I have a quick question. So thank you very much, Mehdi, uh, for the nice talk. Yes. Um, uh, how did you estimate the uncertainty? Uh, with uh, RTAMC dropout or a version of uh, Moncalo dropout. Okay. This is and a, is this this is a the... connection. This is a mathematic connection. Okay. Is this the uncertainty in terms of the change or uncertainty in terms of the semantic segmentation uh, for the model? So maybe with one sentence, can you summarize uh, what is the uncertainty in your model? What does it show? Oh, it, uncertainty estimation after feature extraction in this model. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that it improves the change detection performance? In general, uh, the train model in the deep learning train model is blind segmentation or is blind detection uh, of. Uh, Every, every object, but uh, in this model, it's uncertainty estimation in model uh, and uh, help and helps uh, for and helps uh, for certainty uh, on results on my results. Okay, thank you. Look. Thank you, Mehdi. I think we don't have any question left, so we can move to the next presentation. So the next talk will be given by Sebastian Simbarashi Mukonza from the National Ping Tong University of Science and Technology in Taiwan. His 3MT title is Water Equality, Satellite Observations, Artificial Intelligence. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Water quality, satellite observation, and artificial intelligence. I want you to listen to my personal story. I wanted to access the library during the peak of the pandemic. And strangely, the thermal scanner temperature sensor showed that my, my body temperature was perfect, 36.9. However, the access automated access control point denied me access. Immediately, I knew this was a case of biased artificial intelligence, particularly a convolutional neural network trained with biased data set. So now I want to juxtapose my personal experience and my research. So I'll take you through a water quality and pollution crisis cycle. On my, uh, on my slide at the center is water quality, what we monitor, because urbanization, industrialization, and booming global population has resulted in climate change. Climate change combined together with increasing agricultural productivity has resulted in increasing precipitation-induced surface runoff water pollution, nutrient pollution, and warming water temperature bodies. This negatively impact water quality. Because there is increasing water pollution, we use satellite sensors to monitor water quality. And this satellite sensor produces a lot of data, which is uh, in form of pixel color values, which is inputted into a convolutional neural network as input training data for prediction of different eutrophic water classes. Our finding from this study is that the convolutional neural network consistently and correctly classified clear water and consistently misclassified polluted water. And the novelty of this research is that it produces a unique algorithm that deals with that problem of biased data sets, improving overall accuracy across water quality. The significance of this study is that if you can't monitor, you can't control. And if you can't control, you can't mitigate. And the Guardian and the AB newspaper 
gives two graphical examples of effect of water pollution impacting on water quality. And if you don't deal with water quality pollution, it's going to impact the global GDP. I thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So. Thank you, Sebastian, for your nice uh, slide. We have two short questions. The first one, which kind of the remote sensing data you use? And the second one, in, uh, in which region you conduct your, uh, your research? OK, for the first one, we used the satellite data. Uh, in one case, I used uh, Sentinel-2 data. And in one case, I used Landsat-8 data. Then uh, what was this, your second question again? area your region of investigation or oh, it is in taiwan here in taiwan okay thank you uh, i have a quick quick uh, quick question you mentioned that uh, you have developed or your algorithm is unique can you tell why can you can you can you tell why it is unique uh, it's unique because uh, usually bias data sets because this uh, particular specific research deals with biased data sets uh, most uh, algorithms are not capable of improving their accuracy if you have got a problem of biased data sets but in this case the novel algorithm that we designed was able to deal with this problem using weighted k cross-validation. So it improves the accuracy across all the water classes. Because uh, remember I said uh, the problem with the convolutional neural network before the weighted k cross-validation was that it was mis misclassifying a uh, polluted water, but it was classifying clear water correctly. But after using this uh, algorithm, the overall accuracy for all the classes increased significantly. OK, thank you. So thank you, Sebastian. I think there are no questions anymore. Thank you. And then we will go to the next presentation which will be given by Mira Shivani Sankar from the Center for Wireless Network and Applications from Amrita Vishwa Vidyapitam in India. Her TMT talk is about renovate, revolutionize, how to reduce the urban heat island effect. So Mira, the floor is yours. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you very good. Yeah, okay. Um, India has reported around 60,000 heat-related deaths for the past two decades. Heat-related mortality among people aged about 65 has increased by 50% globally, and especially for the urban residents, the Thermal Stress Act further exacerbates the urban heat island. Urban heat island is a region that is warmer than the surrounding area resulting in a discomfort among the people. Our research is about making suburban region, specifically the Rockford city in India, more sustainable by renovating the houses and buildings using green architecture visions. The first phase of our research is identifying the hotspots based on land surface temperature maps, climatic maps, which can be derived from remote sensing data sets. In order to understand the prevailing environmental conditions, we set out for field survey, generated mock models, and uh, carried out simulation. Most of the buildings, houses, asphalt roads, parking lots, absorb and retain heat. And also, waste heat is generated from industries, vehicles, contribute to the rise in ambient temperature. If we can reduce the air temperature even a little bit, the impact on the environment would be tremendous. This is addressed in the 
second part of our research, that is mitigation strategies. There are many mitigation measures that can be adapted to reduce the effects, such as installation of heat protection glasses, usage of cool paints, increasing the rate of urban vegetation, and so on. Our research compared the efficiency of different kinds of mitigation strategies. Once these suggestive measures were applied in the hotspots in the models, we noticed that the environmental conditions got better. Especially in one of the buildings shown in the uh, moderate hotspot here, the ambient temperature enormously reduced by eight degrees Celsius, which is really encouraging. Urban development, rapid urbanization, increasing population, climate change, all together can intensify the urban heat islands effect. Thus, taking measures right now would be the best time. We aspire to see green architecture vision and sustainable technologies become the norm in future urban planning. Houses play an integral part in our lives, but their impact on the environment must be as less as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira. Thank you. So, any questions? I think um, Professor Yakub has a question. Or Professor Mohammed, so please. Um, hello. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, your contribution here in this work. Um, it's uh, from your slides that I, I cannot uh, recognize the methodology. So what I understood is that uh, you are trying to uh, classify the um, land cover uh, to, into these classes in the middle, the middle, the middle image, and they propose uh, some mitigation uh, on the right image. Am I right? Yes. So. What's the methodology you have used to uh, get the uh, results in the middle image? Okay, uh, we have used NVMet software in order to carry out the simulation process. And we have chosen the mitigation measures based on the quality of life in the hotspots by the people and also by the urbanization patterns. Um, so you have inputs like, um, I mean, you have some descriptive, descriptive inputs and you try to by hand or uh, you label this area by hand um, in order to propose some mit uh, mitigations, right? Yes, we you digitized. Sorry? We digitized all the features from Google Earth images. Mm. Yeah. Do you, have, the, uh, do you have results? Is it possible to, me to measure how accurate your results are? Yeah, we have also uh, estimated the efficiency of these measures in NVMet software itself. We have estimated the uh, temperature, relative humidity for all the hotspots. But there is no way to measure if these results are uh, accurate enough or there is no feedback if these results are accurate, right? I mean, you can yeah, estimate the, the resulted temperature, the reduce in the temperature, and the improvement of the life quality, but you cannot say, uh, is it accurate or is it a bad estimation? Do you have some uh, quantitative measures? Yes, we have quantitative measures. We purchased all the microclimatic parameters from uh, weather online .in. And then only we have uh, simulated it. So it's kind of all the measurements are accurate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, I have one short question here. The two images that you show here are uh, over this are representing the same area. I mean, the image yes. on the left and the image on the right. So can, can yes. you say what is this kind of change in the lesions? I see here, for example, black, then it will become with different color. So. Can you explain this? Yeah. So uh, the current scenario is what the conditions are right now in the hotspot. 
The black color is the asphalt road that is laid in the hotspot area. So we are suggesting if this asphalt road is made into a coated asphalt road, the environmental impact would be good or the better betterment in the environmental conditions, which is in the pink color in the uh, right image. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mira. So we will now go to our final presentation, which will be given by Balkis Asma Samshuddin from the University of Muhammad Bugara Boumardes in Algeria. Her 3MT talk will be about very high resolution multispectral remote sensing image classification. So Asma, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So just start whenever you want. Okay, thank you. Earth observation images are useful in many areas. They are used to generate maps, evaluate urban expansion. They are also widely used by scientists, for example, to assess the effects of deforestation or to estimate the impact of nature disasters, such as earthquakes and forest fires. The technology used by satellites to capture Earth images is in a constant improvement. In the past, satellite images were not really detailed, and it was easy to implement algorithms that detect objects based on their color, which we call spectral information. Nowadays, satellites capture Earth images more than 1,000 times better, increasing the amount of details, yet images became hard to process by classical image classification algorithms. Image classification algorithms enable computers to identify what pixels represent. A pixel is the smallest entity of an image. When given an image, the computer only sees a set of pixels, which is a matrix with a bunch of numbers. Based on these numbers and using image classification tools, a computer can identify pixels as land cover objects. In an urban area, for example, it would be able to know which pixels constitute trees, grass, buildings, roads, and parking lots. But with the currently available satellite images, also known as very high resolution satellite images, algorithms that use classical image classification models have proven their limitations. As they get easily confused with the abundant amount of information, because they treat each pixel as an independent entity, regardless of the nearby pixels, which is no longer sufficient. My work consists of helping computers give a better interpretation of satellite images, as opposed to classical image classification methods where each pixel is taken separately. I design algorithms that translate the context of each pixel based on the other pixels surrounding it. In other words, each pixel of the image would not only have its spectral information, but it will also have additional information about where it is placed in the image, depending on the other pixels surrounding it. Therefore, pixels representing the same object would have enough information that characterizes them, and the computer would see them as groups of pixels instead of individual pixels. For example, pixels that represent trees would have enough information that helps computer distinguish them from those of grass. Based on this additional data, it is easier for the computer to learn to, the, to distinguish between all objects present in the image. I have successfully implemented a variety of techniques that satisfy the purpose and surpass the existing methods, enabling the computer to identify sometimes more than 94% of the image. I'm sure you're all familiar with Google Maps. Well, in my field of research, the methods that I contribute in developing make it possible to have similar softwares and apps. Our algorithms enable computers to understand satellite images closer to the way human brains do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asma. So we have Thank some you. time for questions. Yeah, sure. Yes, I have a question. Thank you very much, Asma, for your very nice uh, presentation. So if I correctly understand, uh, you, you use both uh, pixel-based and, uh, and object-based uh, classification technique. Am I all right, uh, correct? Yes, yes. Actually, I try to incorporate, extract and incorporate special information uh, in the per pixel classification. Okay, so you use the textural information. Yes, uh, well, sometimes. Okay, but, uh, okay. 
which kind of textual information you use? Well, so I have uh, two papers. One, uh, a paper where I, where I compared SVM per pixel classification to UNET semantic segmentation. Uh, I have also another paper. Uh, actually, both of them were presented I, uh, at uh, M2 GARS uh, 2020. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, Asma, here I see uh, I see uh, one box and, uh, and another one circle. In the box, you put classification, and in the circle, you put algorithm. So can you tell me what is the difference between these two things here? OK, so uh, the classification box is just meant for a classification, like using a classifier, for example, like SVM. The algorithm uh, is supposed to be the tool to extract the special information in order to be fed to the classifier in addition to the uh, pixel spectral information. Okay, so can, can we just, uh, I mean, uh, in this way, we can just call it feature extraction. Do you agree with me? Uh, yes, yes, sure. It is actually, it actually is. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Asma. So thank now all the presentations are complete. So the judging panel will move to a private breakout room to discuss their results. And we here, we will stay here. And then it's time now for to vote for your best presentation. So you can scan the uh, QR code here, or I will post the link in the chat box. Uh, sorry, Feirouz, we have to yeah. vote just one or uh, up to three? Oh, only one. So you, 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 you have the right to vote only to one a finalist and only one time. OK. Now it's time to announce the winners. I will give the floor to the judges to do that. Um, okay, just one second. Yeah, so. Okay, so um, thank you very much for all our candidates for their uh, great talks. We really enjoyed listening and uh, impressed with the quality of the talks. So our work was really very tough. It was very challenging. And um, I would like to emphasize once more about uh, our evaluation criteria. So you know that um, for all the candidates, the first round was about the scientific originality and the topic originality, scientific quality, and so on. But for this round, we have evaluated all the presentations in terms of communication, comprehension, engagement capabilities of the presenters, okay? So here it is all about these uh, terms and we didn't evaluate here the scientific quality. Okay, so I would like to really make it very clear that it was a kind of, in short, your pitching capability, okay? In three minutes. So now uh, I would like to announce the results. So uh, we will be starting with the third winner, I think. Am I right, Fyrus? Fyrus? Okay. With the third winner. Yes. So the third place is taken by Balkas Asma Shems Hedin. So congratulations, Balkas. Thank you. Congratulations, Asma. Yes. Okay, so now it is time to announce the uh, second winner. And second winner is, <laughs> can we see the slide, please? Edana Frat. So congratulations, Edana. Thanks so much. Congrats. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
So now it is time to uh, announce the uh, first place uh, winner. And the first place is taken by Mira Shivani Sankar. So congratulations, Mira. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations to our winners and also all the attendees. So I would like to really emphasize that the competition was tough. You know, we had really very interesting and great talks. And uh, yeah, we evaluated uh, based on this criteria to assign the winners and uh, congratulations, congratulations again to all our winners. So um, now, uh, Paris, it's over to you again. Yeah, yeah. So we have the People's Award winner, which is Sebastian. Congratulations, Sebastian. You got the most of the voting. <laughs> so congratulations, everyone. And even if you didn't win this competition, so you did really great. And all the presentation were very nice. And you will get all certificates from IEEE. Okay. So before ending, I would like to also thank uh, to uh, our panel members for their uh, great job. So thank you very much to everybody. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to be here today and to support our uh, competitors and big thanks for all the judges and also the audience to be to, to, to have joined us today. Thank you very much. Great. Hi everyone. We are very delighted to officially announce the three minute thesis competition winners at M2Cars 2022. And before I start, I want to convey a special thanks to all the members of the evaluation committee of the 3MT and also to all the 3MT finalists for their hard work and very interesting presentation and the great work. So the third place of the best three minute thesis awards is presented to Balkis Asma Samshuddin from the University of Hamad Bougara Boumerdes in Algeria for her excellent presentation titled Very High Resolution Multispectral Remote Sensing Image Classification. Congratulations, Balkis. So you're here, I think. So yes, I start? am. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm very glad to be among the winners of the MT competition. I mean, I didn't really expect it at all. And I, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you and congratulations. Thanks again. The second place of the best team MT awards goes to Eda Nur Firat from Ege University in Turkey for her excellent presentation with the title An Investigation of the Relationships between Sugar Beet Yield and Biophysical Vegetation Indices Obtained from Multispectral Images. Congratulations, Idanur. Thank so. you. And uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society for organizing this symposium and let us chance to attend it. And then I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the members of the jury of this competition. Their very understanding approach made me very happy, actually. And of course, I would like to thank to my supervisor, Associate Professor Tolga Setile. I always feel his support and feel lucky about it. And I want you to know that you have deemed me, deemed me worthy of this award, has motivated me more to work in this field. I'm sure that all my participating friends will continue to be very successful in their careers. Uh, yesterday, March 8, was International Working Women's Day, and three of my working women friends achieved a success on this special day. Thank you again for giving us such a mean meaningful moment like that. Uh, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you. <laughs> Great, congratulations again. Good luck for your career. <laughs> So the first place of the best CMT awards is presented to Mira Shivani Sankar from Amrita University in India with, uh, for her outstanding presentation titled Renovate and Revolutionize How to Reduce the Urban Heat Island Effect. Mira, so are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, warm greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this award. 
um i'm i'm con- i'm completely speechless and yesterday as like ada said um it could be the best gift one can receive on women's day uh i would like to thank all the juries for listening uh, to our talks and suggesting valuable uh, uh, suggestions for our future work and i'll extend the thanks for the organizing committee for uh, completely uh, guiding us and suggesting many tips to have a smooth experience throughout thank you so much thank you too for your great work and good luck <laughs> and we have also a uh, last award which is the people's choice award which goes to sebastian simbarashi mukonza from the national pingtung university of science and technology in taiwan for his excellent presentation titled water quality satellite observation artificial intelligence so the audience voted for him and congratulations sebastian i think you are here too or Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Congratulations. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks very much. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers and the participants in this uh, competition and this conference. It has been a very informative uh, exercise. I want to thank you once again for affording me this opportunity and all the other participants thank you thank you too and congratulations again to everyone and we wish you the best of luck in your research and future career thank you thank you